Turn your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will. We'll continue the, uh, um, the spiritual basics, the Christian basics series that we began. We did part one uh, two weeks ago on uh, Bible intake and, um, and prayer. And this is just uh, to kind of cover some... I, I don't really like to call them basic topics, but I, I don't really know a better word. They are just kind of foundational. Maybe we could call them foundations. Uh, may, it might have been better, but they are basics. These are things that are basic uh, to the Christian faith that I guess we just want to make sure as a church that we're reminding ourselves of, or uh, for anybody who might be listening um, on the internet or anybody who might be here that's one of the younger people who haven't learned this stuff yet, we want to make sure that we have... Uh, just constant kind of reminders about these um, foundational Christian principles. And so last week we talked about the importance of reading the Bible and getting our minds, uh, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry, but getting our minds renewed, right? Uh, the things we take in affect us. They affect our mind, they affect our soul, they affect the way we think, and even just going out into that world, even if we're not trying to, you're going to take in things. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 tell us to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then Philippians uh, chapter 8 tells us to think about the things that are pure and lovely and good, and the God of peace will be with us. And so we talked about the importance of uh, the Bible and how it, it really reveals who God is to us. It reveals the way of salvation in Christ to us. And without the scripture, we are just kind of navigating and walking around this world on our own. So we talked about that last week, and then we talked about the importance of prayer. So God reveals himself and um, who he is and how we are to relate to him and one another in the scripture. He communicates to us. Uh, we communicate to him through prayer. Our will is aligned with his through prayer. We, uh, um, and and we, we commune with the Lord through the Bible intake and through prayer. And so that was last week. This week we're going to move on, or two weeks ago anyway, but we're going to move on to spiritual gifts and serving. I don't know again if we'll get through all these topics. We've got spiritual gifts and serving. We have evangelism. We have uh, stewardship, church, and then living uh, the Christian life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of them are lengthy, some of them are not, but anyway let's get started. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 we'll start in uh, talking about spiritual gifts and serving. So it's important to read the Bible. It's important to pray. Uh, once we've come to salvation in Christ, now um, we're given, once you come to faith in Christ, you're given spiritual gifts. There are uh, a God-given, uh, spirit-empowered ability for service. That's what a spiritual gift is. God gives you uh, certain abilities and power to minister to others. And that's what a spiritual gift is. Each believer has different gifts. And um, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us to, uh, that, that they're all necessary. And that we're not to look down upon those who have different gifts than we do. Or to look at those and say, well, they're not as important. And so on. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12. This is a lengthy passage, 4 through 27. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body... That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would, make, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? Where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. <clears throat> and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you, still, show you a still more excellent way. And so that is a very lengthy passage, and I hope we followed along there to see that these gifts, these spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. They are, uh, they are uh, acted out in the Holy Spirit, he says early on. And therefore, the, the, the building up of the church. Now, certain gifts, um, and we could go on and on and on with this, and we could exegete what all of these different things mean. We're trying to just take a flyover today. Um, we did cover this, uh, some in Romans. Um, I will try to link up uh, some of the other teaching we might have on this, or at least put some links if you'd like uh, any further um, any further study on this passage because it's a, there's a lot in here. Also, our statement of faith has some stuff in there about this passage. Um, but certain gifts were given for the foundation of the church during the apostolic era, and they're, they're no longer given now that the foundation has been laid. There, was, uh, there were miraculous sign gifts, uh, divine revelation, miraculous healing, speaking in tongues, all things that uh, you know we believe God could do still, but that God on the normal basic operation of life does not, uh, does not in most cases do those things. Um, the, uh, the gifts were meant to authenticate the apostles' teaching. And so those are no longer necessary. They're no longer given now that the scriptures are complete. Um, again, we still believe God can do anything. Our statement of faith reflects that, that if God so chooses, he can cause one of us here to... Uh, to speak in a language that we don't understand. Um, but, but under normal operation, I don't, I don't think we see that. A lot of the church today, um, but I don't want to discount that, again, that the possibility exists. But uh, in a lot of the church today, um, there's a lot of, uh, this is going to be controversial, but there's a lot of gibberish that people pass off as speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues scripturally was a known language, uh, a language that wasn't known to the speaker. But it was a known language, and it was for the edification of the saints. Paul goes on to say <clears throat> that if there's no one to interpret the tongues, there's no sense in speaking in tongues because it doesn't edify anybody. Nobody understands it. So speaking in tongues in the Bible, just to be clear, was, uh, was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, was a manifestation of God's presence, and it was uh, a situation where... It would be a known language that would be able to be interpreted by somebody for the building up and the edification of the body. So there is some abuse of this in the church today where um, there are things that are absolutely not known languages that are, that are said to be some kind of spirit language, and we don't see that scripturally. Um, so not to get too sidetracked on that, um, but like I said, our statement of faith at Northwest reflects the fact that there were specific gifts that are kind of mentioned there that sometimes we don't normally see in, in normal operation anymore because the time and the necessity for them have passed. Nevertheless, 
the Lord is able to do anything that the Lord wants to do. And if the Lord needs to reach somebody in a certain way, we are by no means saying that he doesn't reach someone in some jungle, uh, you know, through a dream or something like that, right? We know that the primary way that people are saved is through the hearing of the gospel, but we are in no way saying that God could not, uh, you know, and I just use dreams as another example of things that you saw more in Scripture before the Word was complete. Now that it's complete, uh, the Gospel is preached, and that's the primary way that people come to faith. But again, that's not to say that the Lord, at His own prerogative, could not, if He chose, go to some remote jungle and come to somebody in a dream and bring them to salvation after they have heard the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So anyway, um, little side note on the gifts. Uh, because of some things that were in that passage. So, the scriptures are the standard by which our teaching, or man's teaching, is to be authenticated. If Mike says something, if I say something, if anybody says anything, be like the Bereans. Uh, make sure we can back that up with some scripture. Make sure we at least have um, a reason for saying what we said. And that just goes for everybody. Don't just trust any teaching that you hear. Um, but the scriptures now uh, are the standard by which we authenticate teaching. We, uh, the sign miracles and things like that have, have, uh, are not as necessary. But you saw that in the book of Acts a lot. Um, now, what's the purpose of these gifts? So, we're given a spiritual gift or several spiritual gifts. Uh, some would say that you're given kind of one primary gift or gifting. Um, you're given at least one thing uh, by the Lord when you come to faith in Christ and you'll be able to serve the Lord in that capacity. Um, we believe, you know, I believe that the Lord has given us many different traits and, and giftings to be able to uh, serve Him with. But what's the purpose? Ephesians 4.12 says that the purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. That's what these gifts are for. And so, just in closing, again, to not go too far with that, uh, serve in different ways. Try some things out. If you want to know, what has God gifted me with? What, what are the things that God has given me uh, that allow me to serve? Um, try some things out. Serve in different ways. Evaluate your, your natural interests and uh, your desires and drives. Discover what your, your spiritual gifts are. Discover what it is that the Lord is asking you to do in service. Now, uh, for me personally, um, there have been things that I thought I would be good at or thought I wanted to do, and once I tried them, uh, I realized I wasn't gifted for those things. But I look over at other people, and they're very gifted for those things. And so that's how it works. That's how these spiritual gifts are. Uh, we're all members of the body in Christ. I keep moving this podium. Uh, we're all members of the body of Christ, and each member is necessary and important. So, um, so we must be careful of that. We must be careful to say, you know, this job is not as important as this job. Uh, that guy preaches, so that's way better than, than this person over here who, who is, is ministering one-on-one -on -one to people when they're hurting. And that's not, that's not true. Right? And, and this passage has taught us that, that there's, there are many gifts. All are important. It's like a body working together. You know, you might think the uh, thumbnail is not important until you really need the thumbnail to tear something open or whatever that may be. So you understand the point there on spiritual gifts. Um, so pray about that. Pray about where you are in that. And remember, again, that it's, just go back to verse 4 in, in 1 Corinthians 12. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit who gives them is what it's saying. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Remember that it is God who empowers your service. How much trouble do we get into when we do our serving of the Lord in our own strength. We get in a lot of trouble. We get burned out. We get tired. We get bitter. We get all kinds of things. And so remember that. It's the same God empowers them all and everyone. God empowers this, not us. And we don't give this to ourselves. To each is given, verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You're given some kind of manifestation of the Spirit. You're to 
You're to serve out of the power of the Holy Spirit, and it is for the common good of the church. And then he goes on and gives, again, some examples. Um, uh, some utter wisdom, some utter knowledge according to the Spirit. Some uh, have this gift of, of faith and can, can inspire others to that. Some uh, gifts of healing, um, again, to another working of miracles. And uh, again, this is, uh, some of this is more uh, geared toward the time period here. To another prophecy, uttering the truth of the Lord. Various kinds of tongues, some people actually speaking in other languages that they have not learned, that are being interpreted by others for the building up of the church. And they're all empowered, again, by the Spirit. Okay, so spiritual gifts, just a quick run through. All right, and uh, um, study that up in Scripture. Follow that, follow that lead. Follow uh, the couple of places that... that uh, um, that will list these gifts off. There's a couple places in Scripture that'll 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 point you to uh, different gifts, and you can kind of evaluate yourself up against those things. So evangelism is another one of these basics for us. Uh, evangelism that's sharing the gospel, spreading the gospel. And I know we're we're just kind of doing an overview and shifting gears there. Um, so, what, so that's what evangelism is. The why is the big question. And that is, the why is the Great Commission. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 19. Okay, so if you're following along, again, it's important to read the Bible. It's important to pray. Uh, it's important for us to know that we've been given spiritual gifts in order to serve. And it's important to take that gospel, and in part of our service, that gospel is to be proclaimed to others. That's evangelism. That's, Jim should be up here teaching evangelism. Jim's an evangelism guy. He's the guy. Um, Matthew 28, 19, Jim or Mike, right? Just guys who are gifted for just going out there and, uh, and, and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for folks like that who just are unashamedly um, un, unhindered in, in their love for sharing what Jesus Christ has done uh, for, for the forgiveness of sins. So Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So make disciples of all nations. That's all of our jobs. That's going to look a little bit differently. Not everybody's going, going to go into the streets uh, and, and, and street preach. Not everybody is going to go and... Um, Ray Comfort stands on the soapbox with the megaphone and, and he, he, he gives the gospel right out in the middle of the streets. Um, that's what I should have done in New York, girls. That's what we should have done in Times Square. We got to go back. Anyway, um, just kidding. But uh, what's that? Might not have made it home if I'd done that, yeah. Um, some do that, but others, right? Others do it in the home, teaching their children, schooling their children. Others... Uh, Others do it from a pulpit. Others do it at work. I know Mike does it at work a lot, right? Mike has a really large track ministry and ministers one-on-one -on -one to the people in his life. Um, I thank the Lord that he's, he's, he's brought people into my life uh, that I've been able to do that with at my jobs at times um, to minister to them and the things that they're going through or answer questions that they have or let them know that, hey, there's a better way. There's, a, there's God's way of doing things. There's God's, you know, first of all, we have to get, get our sin problem taken care of and, and so on and so forth. So evangelism is very important. It can take many forms. Um, it's, uh, it's to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 10, 9 talks about <clears throat> how people have been... Uh, have People have been... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? been made ministers of the gospel. God has entrusted us with the gospel. Romans 10, starting in verse 9, says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. 
He's talking about Jews and non-Jews there. The people of God and the not people of God, or the chosen nation of Israel and everyone else. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that he has heard from us? Or what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So you can see people here are given the responsibility to share the gospel. That how is someone to call on the Lord if they don't believe? And how are they to believe if they've never heard? How are they to hear if no one's ever been sent to tell them? And so Jesus, talking to his followers, already sent all of us. Back in, again, Matthew 28. Make disciples of all nations. That's given to all of us. First, or, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians uh, 5 talks about us being ambassadors for Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 20. Chapter 5, verse 20, that would be. Um, therefore, uh, um, let's just start in verse 16. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, Paul here is talking about he and the other apostles have been made uh, Ministers of this reconciliation, reconciling, reconciliation means to, to make that relationship right. So Paul's talking about uh, his ambassadorship, he and the apostles, but this trickles down to everyone. This trickles down to everyone who becomes a follower of Christ, becoming an ambassador for Christ. And again, that's back to Matthew 19. That's told to the followers of Jesus. We are all to be preaching the gospel in one way or another to be telling people about the hope that we have. 1 Peter 3, 15, we just went through not long ago. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. And so that's our mandate. We are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is, uh, if you're an ambassador to another country, you, you know, say I'm an ambassador for the United States and I go to some other country, I'm representing the United States. I am saying uh, a message on behalf of the United States. That's how that would work with, with an ambassador to a country. That's how it works with Christ. If we are ambassadors for Christ, that means we represent Christ. That means we speak the message that Christ has given us to speak. That means that our mission is Christ's mission. Just like you'd walk in as an ambassador from the United States of America to, say, Japan or whatever. We're walking into the world as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We preach his message, we walk his walk, we do all of that. So that's evangelism. We are all called to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. We are all called to be ministers of this reconciliation. And if you need to be refreshed on the reason for the hope that you have, again, write down 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 20, and 21. Or I'm sorry, well, 16 through 20, which was what we, or 21, which is what we just read. I'll remind us again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was recon reconciling the world to himself, 
What does that mean? Again, comma, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, for our sake, all of us, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That, folks, is the reason for the hope that you have because he made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that we, all who believe in him, might become the righteousness of God. All who would place their faith and their trust in Christ. That's the reason for the hope that we have. That is the message. If you ever don't know how to share the gospel, there it is. And you'll find it all over the place. But that's, that's, uh, that's a bare bones uh, gospel. Also, uh, is it 1 Corinthians 15? Write that one down. 1 Corinthians 15, I believe, 1 through 8. Yes. For I delivered, so three through eight, First Corinthians 15, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of all, uh, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And so there's the gospel. There it is again. Okay, so we are to be in the word of God. We are to be in prayer, to align ourselves with God, and to be in the will of God. We are to, uh, uh, to exercise our spirit-given gift or gifts for the good of the church. We are to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now stewardship. We are to be good stewards of all that God has given us and entrusted us. Um, now stewardship. We talk, what is stewardship? That's just, it's managing the, the, uh, the ownership of somebody else's, right? It's managing, uh, we're stewards of the things God has given us. The scripture tells us that we own nothing. God owns it all, right? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He created everything. He sustains everything. God is the owner of it all, and he has entrusted it to us. And we have a responsibility in how we use it, how we share it, how we spend it, whatever it is. And it's not just money, but it's other things. It's time, it's talent, and it's treasure. Scripture tells us that our time is short, and we don't often think about time stewardship, do we? Brian and I have talked about this, that for years I only thought about money stewardship, you know, and I go, well, I don't want to pay to have my car fixed because, you know, Lord and trust, I can do better things with this money, I can do it myself. But there's time stewardship. And so, well, I could spend 12 hours doing a job I don't know how to do and cost my family time with me and cost, you know, rest and fatigue before I have to go to work and, the, you know, whatever. And sometimes it's better to spend that couple hundred bucks and just have it done. You have to balance those things. So some of this is going to be a personal decision on how to steward best the things that God's given us. But time is one of those things. And that's one of those things I do want to point out. We don't often think about that. We think about money and we think about those things, but we don't think about time. We do need to redeem the time because it is short. Scripture tells us that. Ephesians 5. 15 through 17, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Again, how do we understand what the will of the Lord is? Scripture, prayer. That's how we understand what the will of the Lord is. So let's redeem our time. We're in a culture now where time is just wasted away so much. Um on leisure and on hobbies and on all kinds of things and none of those things are bad in themselves but we need to be serious as believers about how we use our time time that the lord has given us on this earth very limited and so how are we using that time talent is another thing again go back to spiritual gifts how are we using the talents that we are naturally given? Again, what are they for? Ephesians 4.12, we already said, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's what we're to use these gifts for, to minister to others. So our times and our talents, um, 
you know, and we've, we've seen people in our church do that. We've seen people who are mechanically inclined say, I can fix that lawnmower for you. I'll minister to you in that way so that you can serve your family and your home. And, and we've seen people volunteer their time to, uh, I have expertise in that, I'll fix that thing at the church or I'll, I'll um, you know, build this thing at this person's home or we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll bring these meals to these people or what have you. There's all kinds of examples on how to um, share your talents and your gifts. And then treasure, um, treasure, our money. There's a lot to be said here. Um, we'll say it quickly. We don't have a lot of time. Um, but uh, we are to, with our treasure, uh, we're told in Scripture to, to be honest in how we acquire it. So gain this money honestly. Um, Proverbs 11.1 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Don't cut the corners. Don't drag your feet at work and steal money from the employer so you can make more. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So give generously. Proverbs 13.11, Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. And the Lord will come through on His word. Dishonest money will dwindle away, but gather it little by little. Gather it wisely and it will grow. Proverbs 10, 4, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. We see a lot of that in this culture today, don't we? Lazy hands who say, well, you know what? Work's hard and it's not that fun. So um, I'll sit home and let, uh, let um, the system pay for me. And, and again, that's not to say there, aren't, there are legitimate needs we're thankful in this country. I've had talks with people in this church who fell on hard times, and we're thankful for the excellent, wonderful systems that we have in, the, in place in this country for hardship. But we know, especially in a post-COVID world, in a COVID world and a post-COVID world, my goodness, my goodness, how you cannot find every, you talk to employers of any sort, in any, you know, in, in my, in the freight industry, we run into a lot of different industries. The medical field, construction industry, I mean, you name it, because we haul all kinds of things. And so we talk to people from all different industries and walks of life, from retail, like I said, to medical, I mean, and everything in between. Industry, manufacturing, you name it. Nobody can find employees because nobody wants to work or nobody can work because they uh, are doing drugs and other things. And I know I'm speaking in very general terms here, but we, we have... We have a problem in our nation the, uh, today with uh, the young people not understanding the value of hard work. And part of that is biblical ignorance, that we don't know that the Lord says the work is good. We don't know that the Lord, the Lord designed work to be good. And then a good, honest, hard, day, hard day's work and you lay your head down at night um, is a good thing. And your sleep is sweet knowing that you have worked and gained honestly. We're missing that in our culture today, and it's part of the church's job to be the ones to stand up and say, this is what the Word says about that. So these aren't easy topics, and I'm not trying to offend anybody by saying that, but it's true. It is true that we have, we have kind of an epidemic going on right now where um, you know, the young people are not being taught the value of work or, well, I don't need to work because I can, my parents can pay for it for the rest of my life or whatever. And, uh, Proverbs 10 says that lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. So gain your money honestly. Honor God with your, your money, and, but, but properly esteem it as well. Don't put it on too much of a, a pedestal because Matthew 21 says that for where your treasure is, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So be careful where your heart is and where your treasure is. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Matthew 6, Jesus again, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then 1 Timothy 6.10, often misquoted, by the way. We're going to be very careful quoting this passage. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is a, is a root of all kinds of evil. A lot of times we say the, 
Love of money is the root of all evil. That's not how it goes. It's the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Many different kinds of evil can spring from the love of money and from greed. That's what this is saying. Some people, and it goes on to explain, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So we need to gain the money honestly. We need to honor the Lord with it. And we need to esteem it properly, though. We need to put it in its proper place in our life, not above God and not above other people. And lastly, we need to give it generously. And we need to give it proportionately, and we need to give it cheerfully. Matthew 6 says our giving should be in secret. We don't walk around head held high because uh, guess what, guys? I just wrote a fat check to the church. See those pews? Yeah, we bought them. You don't do that. That's, that's what... Give in secret. You don't do that. Um, again, Proverbs 3, 9, we already read it. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. With the first fruits. Um, before you honor your own entertainment, before you honor all those other things, honor the Lord with your money. We're taught to give proportionately. Um... In the Old Testament, there was the tithe, which was a 10% uh, starting point to, on your increase. Uh, and when you added it all up, I don't remember, I think it was like 33% when you added all the different things in. The New Testament doesn't require that. The New Testament says give, says give proportionately and give cheerfully. And whatever your heart has, has determined. But with that said, we cannot outgive God. Um, we want to be careful not to rob God, and uh, Jesus usually raises the standard, not lowers it on, on all things, right? We know that from, right, when the law said, don't look at a woman, uh, or, or don't commit adultery with a woman, right? Uh, you, your neighbor's wife and all this. Jesus says, if you even look at her, it's about your heart. If you even look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. If you've hated your brother, you've committed murder, right? The law just said if you murder him, you've committed murder. Jesus says, even if you hate the guy, even if you want to murder him, you have murdered him in your heart already. Jesus always raises the standard. So don't let the New Testament teaching be a deterrent for cheerful, generous giving. But don't let the law, which we're not under anymore, be an oppressive yoke around your neck to say, oh, I need to give, I need to give, I need to give. Work it out between you and the Lord. Work it out between you and the Lord in faith, and that's, that is where you're to be. But we are to give sacrificially. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And remember this when you're giving, people, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So we trust God to provide. Matthew 6. Trusting God to provide. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. He feeds the birds in the air who don't toil or spin. He feeds them. He clothes the grass of the field. How much more valuable are you O oh, you of little faith, he says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this will be added to you. The Lord knows that you need these things. I'm paraphrasing, and I'm mixing it up too. The Lord knows that you have need of these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He knows what we need already. He says, don't seek after that stuff like the Gentiles do. Come to the Lord. Serve the Lord. Let the Lord know your needs. Give generously. He'll work it out. He'll be faithful. Okay, real quick, and we're just going to really buzz through this one. We've been through this a few different times in a few different sermons. Church. So we pray, we read the Bible, we exercise our spiritual gifts, we uh, are, are, are mindful stewards of the things that have been entrusted to us, we uh, are stewards of our time, talents, and our treasures, and our giving. And now church. We've talked before about church. We, we worship. We come and we worship. Church is non-negotiable. It's, uh, it's just a given in, in the scripture that you're going to do this. Okay? Ecclesia. Church. Called out people is what, is what the word means. We are called out people. The purpose, again, we gather each week 
as the church. Remember Hebrews, uh, well, we'll get to that. We gather three reasons to glorify God. That's Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. To edify one another. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, and to tell others about Christ. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, which we already read. We gather to glorify God, to edify one another, and to tell others about Jesus. What does the church do? Acts 2, 42. They were continually devoting themselves. The early church, this is what they did. To the apostles' teaching. For us, that's the reading of the word. That's the word of God. And to fellowship. And to the breaking of bread, referring to communion, and to prayer. Fellowship there means closeness in their lives. Okay? Um, Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, these days in our culture, because of COVID, after COVID, and for a lot of different reasons, we have a lot of online church. That can be good for the shut-in. That can be good in a lot of ways. We're toying with putting our sermons online so that people outside of these walls can hear the gospel preached. However, one of our main deterrents for wanting to do that is it makes it really easy for people not to come to the assembly, for people not to assemble together. Well, I can just watch church at home. The scripture is clear that we are, we're to live in fellowship and closeness together. We can't do that from our houses. We have to do that here. We are to assemble. And so uh, there's great caution, and I would give great caution to anybody who, who is hearing this, right? If this is online and, we've, and, and you're hearing this, uh, please do not use um, sermons that you are able to find uh, from our website or, or whatever. Uh, as a reason not to go to church. We need to go to our local church. We need to be involved in our local church. We need to be fellowshipping with people at our local church. And uh, Hebrews 10 tells us that. And the, because the blessings are, we will glorify God, not just individually, but corporately together. And we will um, edify one another. We build each other up. And like Hebrews 10 says, stimulate one another to love and to good works. And it's an opportunity for us together as a corporate body to go and uh, tell others about Christ. And I can't tell you, I, can't, I don't know how I would live without church. Remember, my grandmother passed away. I found that news out uh, while I was in the shower before church. And we went to church. And I remember people saying to us, it wasn't this church, I can't believe you came. And my answer was, where else would I be? Where else would I want to be right after that news? With the body of Christ with the people who understand death the most. Um, and that's not to toot my horn, but that was truly what I wanted. And people were surprised that we were there. Um, I've had conversations just in the last week with some of you uh, that, that were <laughs> the body of Christ uh, ministering to me. I need that. You need that. We need, to, we need that. And that's why we come here. That's why we meet here. Um, so we can pray together in person, so we can stimulate one another to love and good works. And again, I can't tell you how much phone calls last week when, after we weren't here meant to us, how much that meant that, that, um, to spend a half an hour of, of their day to make sure I'm okay, to make sure my family's okay. Those are the reasons that we edify one another, we glorify God, we tell others about Christ. Lastly, just one verse on this. All of those things. Let our prayer be as we go today that we would be in the Word, that we'd be intaking the Bible and God's precepts at all times, that we would be in prayer and aligning ourselves with God's will, and that we would be, uh, we would be good stewards of the things that God has given us, and that we would be exercising our spiritual gifts, not forsaking, meeting together in the body, and that we would be uh, um, worshiping each week in corporate way and in personal ways, again, back to the Bible intake, you see how it's kind of all-encompassing, right? We worship on our own at home, in the Bible and in prayer. We do it here corporately. And always remembering, and Mike's been talking a lot about this one, that we live the Christian life. We do all of those things, and all the things that we do, not in our own power. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians, with the spiritual gifts. We, in church, and in our homes, and in our lives, we live the Christian life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we'll close with Galatians 3, Verse 2, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law 
or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's saying, you came to Christ by hearing with faith. Now you're going to be perfected and you're going to live the Christian life uh, in your own flesh, in your own strength. Don't be foolish. You live the Christian life the same way you became a Christian, by faith, by trusting in the power of God. Yes, we have obedience that we, oh, trust me, there are many. Again, Jesus raises the standard. We're to guard our thoughts. We're to guard our minds. We're to watch what we say and do. All of that. Put on the old, or put off the old and put on Christ. There are many commands, and we never, I never, ever want to minimize that, right? We don't want to be so hyper grace over here that we forget that we have a responsibility, but we don't want to be so legalistic over here that we forget that it's all the power of the Holy Spirit that empowers it to happen anyway. We want to be right there in the middle where the scripture is balanced, right? That the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. You cannot obey without the Holy Spirit, but you cannot obey without yielding your own spirit. You cannot obey without, without you um, aligning your will with the Lord's. Do you know what I mean? So the Lord ultimately in His power does His work with a willing spirit, with a willing recipient. So... But we, but we remember, Galatians 3, 2. Are we so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are we going to now be per perfected by the flesh? We can't be perfected by our own effort. We need to be perfected by communion with God, which will result in our mind being renewed, which will then result in the works of our hands being purified as we read the Word, and our, our will is conformed to His will. Make sense? Mike will be talking more about all that, I'm sure. I'll be talking more about all that, I'm sure. And so let's close in prayer today and uh, honor God with, uh, with the last bit of our service. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. There's always, there are so many of these balances in Scripture that are hard, right? Um, how much responsibility, uh, you know, God is sovereign and you save us and it's all you, but yet man is responsible to respond. Uh, or sanctification, me becoming more like Christ is, is the work of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh, as Galatians says, but yet, but yet I have a responsibility. Lord, help us to work out those balances. Help us to work out those tensions. Um, help us to, to just... Again, we, so much of that gets worked out on its own when we just commune with you, when we just fellowship with you. Help us, Lord, to be taking in the word. Help us to be in prayer. Help us to be exercising these gifts that you've given us. Thank you for giving us these gifts. Thank you for giving us time, talent, and treasure for us to be stewards of. Thank you for giving us the body of Christ to, to live with and fellowship with and to learn from and to glorify you with. And Lord, thank you that your Holy Spirit empowers our Christian living. I heard a preacher once say that, uh, that, that you haven't given us, Lord, any provision to live the Christian life, but you are the provision to live the Christian life. You don't give us some kind of special thing that makes us able to live the Christian life. You are the thing. So we need you, Lord, and we call to you, and we thank you for reminding us today of these, uh, these spiritual foundations, these, the, these basics of the Christian life that we don't want to forget. It's so easy to get wrapped up in all these things that we do in all the cares of the world. Remind us, Lord, of these, of these principles, these foundational um, things that I think we all need to know uh, for the Christian life, no matter what uh, stage we're in, beginning or middle or near our end of, of this life. Uh, so thank you for that reminder today, Lord. Help us to be um, people who honor you and glorify you and fellowship with one another uh, in a godly way. Um, help us to live this Christian life, Lord. We thank you for it, and we love you and praise you and honor you and give all the thanks that you deserve. In Christ's name, amen.